Good morning. Today is Sunday, March 29th, and the Lord still reigns. Thank you for joining us this morning as we seek to worship the Lord in a virtual setting. Nobody is here. Uh, if I may make a personal comment before we start, uh, it's more nervous to preach to an empty congregation than it is if this room was full. So bear with me if I'm a little bit nervous. I'm going to rely a little bit more on my notes than I usually do. Um, but we're experimenting with new technology, new to us anyway. But uh, we do want to uh, welcome you and, and uh, bring some words of encouragement to you. As we seek to worship the Lord today, we will have an abbreviated service of scripture reading, time of prayer. I'll bring a message word, but mostly we want to worship the Lord together today. Let me call us to worship with Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy a revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you have crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Would you join me as we go to the Lord together in a time of prayer? I'll lead, of course, but where you are, whether you're by yourself or with a spouse or family members, fill in the details with the things that are on your heart, the things that you want to pray for, the people you want to pray for. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, you are our Father, and so we come to you as your children, looking for your help, asking for your presence to help us during these difficult days, during the challenges that we face. We ask that you would calm our fears, that you would help us to trust you, to know that you are God, that you still are on your throne, and that nothing is catching you by surprise. So teach us, Lord, to trust in you and to be quiet in your hands. But as we gather this morning, Lord, we do want to pray for those who have become sick from this virus specifically, although we know that there are lots of people dealing with other illnesses and injuries and surgeries and challenges that they face. But we pray specifically for people suffering from this virus that you would grant healing and strength if that would please you. And if not, Lord, that they may experience your presence even in death. And would you be close to their families and friends as they watch helplessly on. We pray for those who are vulnerable to this virus, specifically older people, people with respiratory problems. We pray for their protection. We pray for good sense as we seek to uh, observe social distancing. Lord, keep our older folks safe, we pray. I pray, Lord, for those who have lost their jobs. I think of single moms living paycheck to paycheck just trying to pay the bills and now they've lost their job. I pray for those who have lost their business. Uh, again, people living month to month just trying to make it and now their business has been taken out from under them. Lord, I pray that you would meet their specific physical needs, but I also pray that they would look to you and find strength and hope in you. Lord, let this plague end soon, we pray. 
I pray for our leaders, not just in this country, but around the world. I pray that they would have good sense to make good and wise decisions, not political decisions, but what is best for the people, for this country, and for the world. Lord, I pray that clear heads would prevail. I pray that uh, those working in the medical fields will find the cure and find the ways to treat people who are suffering. I pray that you would protect them as they take care of our sick folks. And Lord, through it all, we pray that you would be glorified. You have promised to bring good out of bad situations. And we call upon that promise now. We pray that you would use this to bring people back to yourself. We pray for a revival. We pray that people would be able to see the love of Jesus, even in times when it doesn't seem you are around. But I pray that you would draw us back to yourself. And we pray for your glory. And we submit ourselves to your care and your guidance. And through Jesus our Lord we pray. Amen. In the last few weeks in our services we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed. Many of you may be familiar with it. Um, we've been kind of dissecting it phrase by phrase to see if and where the Bible speaks about those things, if the creed is biblical and what the Bible says about it. And this morning, we, we're still in the beginning stages of that. We are looking at what the creed says about God being almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn to Psalm 24 and read this as it draws our attention to God's creative abilities. The earth is the Lord and all it contains, and the world and all who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has a clean heart and a pure heart, clean hands, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. I'm going to introduce a new song to you. No, I'm not going to sing it. You're welcome. Uh, but I'm going to read the words to you. They uh, seem to be very appropriate for thinking of God as the Creator and what that means for us in our daily life. This is a very short song. It's called, If God Can Hang the Stars. And here are the words. Uh, maybe you can look it up on YouTube and find somebody singing it. If God can hang the stars on high, can paint the clouds that drift on by, and send the sun across the sky, what could he do through you? If he can send a storm through space and dot with trees the mountain's face, if he, the sparrow's way, can trace, what could he do through you? If God can do such little things as count our hair that sing, control the universe that swings, what could he do through you? You could also say, what could he do for you? God is the almighty God. What could he do through you and for you? The for my message this morning is from Psalm 104. I'm spending a lot of time in the Psalms this morning. But turn in your Bible to Psalm 104 if you have the Bible there handy. 
Psalm 104 is a poetic expression of, of the wonder of God's creation and what he has made and how he has made it and how he sustains it. It's a rather long psalm, it's 35 verses, but follow along as I read this wonderful psalm, Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters he makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wing, wings of the wind. He makes his winds his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over, so that they will not return to cover the earth. He sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They lift up their voices among the he waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. The trees of the Lord drink their fill the cedars of Lebanon, which he, where the birds build their nests, and the stork, whose home is the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the seraphim. Sephanim, excuse me. He made them the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting. You appoint darkness, and it becomes night, in which all the beasts of the forest prowl about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until evening. O oh Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number animals both small and great. There the ships move along, and Leviathan, which you have formed to sport in it, they all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are, and you renew the face of the ground. Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Let my meditation be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall be glad in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, now as we open your word together, and this phrase, the Lord Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we pray that your spirit would speak truth to our hearts, and that would be more and more to the image of your Son, and we would be more and more ready to do what you've called us to do. Bless this time, and bless these people as they watch from their homes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When I was just getting started, they aired clever commercials on talk radio. The setting commercial was a game show, a quiz show. 
And the host would ask the, content, the contestant a totally absurd question. One of the ones that I remember is, what is the square root of Wednesday? The, qu the contestant would reply with an equally absurd non split ice cream. Bells and whistles would ring and the host would proclaim, correct, you are our grand prize winner. I don't know any more than the next person, but I found myself turning the radio dial up to listen to these commercials. They were very clever. I'm still not sure how the ads convinced people to go get Netflix, but then there's lots of commercials that I just don't understand. Ad by deconstructing it, but the humor in the question and answer was due to eating of different orbs of existence. Square roots have to do with Wednesday has to do with calendars and days of the week. Chocolate ice cream exists and melts in the realm of food. The question can be diagrammed like you used to do in high school English class. There is the noun and there's the verb and there are other parts of speech that I've long since forgotten. Putting the words together in a meaningful sort of way, in a meaningful sentence, is beyond the realm of logic and reason. Days of the week do not have square roots. And neither can the solution of a mathematical equation be... But I get it. The absurdity of the question and the answer is what made the commercial humorous and clever. While I try to explain what all this has to do with the next phrase in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And we'll start with that first word, Almighty. Psalm 91 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Revelation 15 3 says, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Bible critics and skeptics and atheists and agnostics and other troublemakers delight to ask the question, can God make a rock so big that he cannot pick it up? It's a great question, isn't it? It's an age question. It dates back as far as we know. It's first recorded by a certain Celsus in the second century AD. It's a long, long ago question. And on the face of it, it looks like it presents to believers an unsolvable dilemma. It's a challenge to our insistence on God being almighty. If God is almighty, then he should be able to make a rock that is impossible even for him to pick up. On the other hand, an omnipotent God should be able to pick up such a rock. It's a gotcha moment. The Bible believer can't answer the question. If we say, no, he cannot create such a rock, then he's not all powerful. And if we say, yes, he could create a rock that he could not pick up, then he's not as mighty as we thought he was. The irresistible force has met the immovable object. So we can no longer confess that God is almighty, can we? For those of you who prefer geometry over physics, here's another way that the challenge is framed. Can God create a four-sided triangle? Uh, clearly, he can't. By definition, a triangle, a four-sided figure is called a quadrilateral, I think. It cannot have only three sides, it must have four, by definition. Again, we are caught on the horns of a dilemma, and we are forced to give up the concept of an almighty God. Here are things that God can't do. Well, before we wave the white flag of surrender, let's go back to that Netflix commercial. 
We saw that the problem in the question and answer was an illogical mixing of two realms of reality. Is that what's going on here in these questions? It doesn't appear to be so. The rock question has to do with physics and geology. The four-sided triangle question has to do with geometry. So they uh, appear to be fair questions. But the Achilles heel of these gotcha questions is in the definition of words. Let's start with the first one, can. Can God do fill in the blank? What do we mean when we claim that God is almighty? Are we saying that God can do anything without exception? Alistair McGrath describes almighty in this way. I'm quoting him. To say that God is almighty means that God can do anything that does not involve logical contradiction. And he goes on to cite Aquinas, who remarked that it was not that God could not do such things, it was simply that such things cannot be done. Let me put it, what is illogical and self-contradictory is not something that can be done. And that has nothing to do with might or power. To insist that Almighty God should be able to do what is contradictory is to display an ignorance in the use of words. The fault of the critic is in the definition of words. He thinks that omnipotence means that God can do anything without exception, without defining what anything means. There are certain things that God cannot do. The Bible says so, and it says so without embarrassment, without seeing none. I'm going to give you three examples. I'm going to give you the Bible references. We won't read them. You look them up at your leisure. But Titus 1-2 and Hebrews 6-18 tell us that God cannot lie. 2 Timothy 2-13 says that God cannot deny himself. Habakkuk 1-13 says that God cannot look upon evil in a tolerating, accepting sort of way. For a holy God to do any of those things would present a logical and no longer be God. So, at the risk of repetition, God is almighty in the sense that he can do anything that can be done. Contradictions are not things that can be done. They merely reflect a misuse of Let's move on to the next phrase. I believe in God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, by the breath of his mouth all their host. Without getting lost in the tall grass, let me briefly explain or present three ways that that can account for the existence of the universe, is that the universe is eternally existent. It has always been. You can see that this gives the universe the quality of godness. Just as God is eternal, the universe is eternal as well. This is pantheism. Sadly, nature worshipers embrace this view. You can call it Mother Nature, you can call our planet Gaia, but it doesn't make it alive, doesn't make it eternal. Another possibility is that the universe is self-created. 
This view of godness from the equation, like the first view does, but in so doing, it creates within itself an inescapable dilemma, a contradiction of its own. There has to be something in order to initiate the creation of something else. Some will or some power has to already in order to bring everything else into existence. To course these bro, one thing is absolutely certain. If anything exists, then something has always existed. Something or someone is eternal. The question is not whether something is eternal. Something is. The question is, what is eternal? Well, the third and the most logically consistent view just happens to be the biblical view. And that is that the universe was, in fact, created, brought into being by someone outside of itself. The question then is, who? And how God Almighty spoke the universe into being. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, and there was. 3 6, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. If you still have your Bible open to Psalm 104, look again at verses 4 through 9, or 5 through 9. He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valleys down to the place which you established for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass over so that they will not return. To and I'm skipping down to verse 19, 20. He made the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting. You appoint darkness and it becomes night. Verse 24. O oh Lord, how many are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. So God's omnipotence leads him to speak the universe into being. And it also describes his relationship to the universe that he has made. Again, quoting R.C. Sproul, he says, Omnipotence simply means that God is in control of his creation and that he exercises dominion over it. End quote. Look at verses 10 and 11 of our text. He sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They give drink to every beast of the field. Verse 14 and 15. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. Verse 27, they all wait for you to give them their food in due season. Verse 30, you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So God creates and he sustains what he creates. God does not need the creation. The creation needs him, certainly, but not vice versa. He is no less God if he had not created the universe. Then why did he create? To impress himself? Is the vast heavenly panoply of space full of stars and galaxies and nebula really necessary to sustain life on earth? Many of those stars and nebula out in deep space we haven't even seen until recently. Were they really necessary to sustain life on earth or did God just create all of that majesty just for fun? He created for his own glory. Revelation 4, 11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and are created. 
Certainly he created for his own glory, but he created for our pleasure, for the wonder of exploration and learning, that we learn about the universe the more we learn about the God who created it. Or if you're not comfortable with thinking about God creating a virus, why did, why did he allow this virus? It's a legitimate question for which we don't have easy answers. Did, did these viruses appear after the fall or were they part of the original creation? We just don't know. In our days of lockdown, in our days of anti-social distancing, we've been watching re the reruns we watched was of an episode of Dirty Jobs. Remember that show? This particular pro featured termites. Well, why in the world did God create ter termites? We learned in the program that termites are necessary to air those fibrous materials in the soil. The scientists on the program were seeking not to kill the termites or to eradicate them, hurt my feelings if they did, but rather to keep them from eating houses. Just as there is a positive use for termites, there may be a positive purpose for viruses. I can't imagine what they might be. But that's because of a lack of understanding, not because of the weakness in God. Omnipotence as meaning that our creator is distant and aloof. It does tyrannical or arbitrary rule. Rather, it is our great hope. How could we survive at all if the Lord, the Creator, wasn't fully in control of His universe and of our lives. On the other hand, if we evict God, like we've been trying so hard to do, get Him out of our schools, get Him out of the public arena, don't talk about God, He's become a dirty word. If we evict God, then we remove any basis for hope in our lives. Here's one skeptic who is at least honest. Edward Carnell says, Modern man appears to be but a grown-up germ, sitting on a gear of a vast cosmic machine which is someday destined to cease functioning because of lack of power. Isn't that sad? How hopeless. That's why the matter of creation is so in the Apostles' Creed, but in our faith as well. God's might leads him to create, and that leads us to rest. Be still and know that I am God. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. God's might leads him to create, and God's might leads him to save. When you think of God's power, don't think of a bomb or a sword or a chariot, comic superhero. Think of the cross. The cross where God bared his arm and displayed his power over Satan, over sin, over death, over anything else that would separate you from him. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The word of the cross is foolishness, 
to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The wonder gospel, which is foolishness to some, is that Almighty, the creator of the universe, stepped into his universe and he became a man. He became part of us for the very purpose of taking the penalty of our sin upon him, giving himself as the sacrifice for our sin in order to draw us back to himself, that we could be with him forever. That's the power of God. Now, folks, here's the hard and painful truth. The fact is that we will all die. Unless the Lord comes back first, we're all going to die. Either this virus or some other illness is going to kill us or we're going to have an accident or die of old age, but something is going to kill us. Are you okay with that? Are you ready for that? And when that, your economy will collapse. You will die empty-handed. Are you okay with that? Now is the time to look to Jesus. Now is the time to call on him while he is near, to ask him to forgive your sin. And now is the time for you to receive his forgiveness and to ask him to be your Lord and Savior. This is why he came and why he died, to present himself as your Savior, to pay the penalty for your sin, for your rebellion, and to draw you back to God, to your Creator. Now's the time to do that. Those of you who have received Jesus, for you and I to try through this crisis, through this life, and into his presence. Wherever you are watching us this morning, if you have any questions or if I may lead Jesus to accepting Jesus, please contact us through our Facebook page, Sayo Creek Independent Presbyterian Church, or go to our website, contact us through Sayo Creek Pres. Let me lead us in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, thank you for the universe that you have made that reflects your glory. We praise you for sustaining your universe. We praise you even for the parts that we don't understand, like sickness and death, suffering. Help us to trust you in these difficult days and help us to live as people who have hope because Jesus has done for And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And to close, I want to read to you, I'm not going to sing, you're welcome. I'm going to read to you the words of the song that we would have closed our service with, and that will serve as a good benediction. This is called God the Omnipotent. God the Omnipotent, King who ordainedest thunder thy clarion, the lightning thy sword, show forth thy pity on high where thou reignest. Give to us peace time, O Lord. God, the all-merciful, earth hath forsaken meekness and mercy and slighted thy word. Let not thy terrors awaken. Give to us peace in our time, O Lord. God, the all-righteous one, man hath defied thee, yet to eternity standeth thy word. Falsehood and shall not tarry beside thee. Give to us peace in our time, O Lord. So shall thy people with thankful devotion praise him who saved them from peril and sword. Singing in chorus from ocean to ocean, praise to the nations 
and praise to the Lord. Amen.